is my pleasure to introdu introduce Dr. Roger Blyler, our senior scientist at uh, our facility in Round Rock, Texas. Roger, it's your show. OK, thank you, Guy. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for taking the time to participate in this webinar. As you can see, the topic for the discussion is a better approach to assessing and monitoring aromas and odors. This analytical approach is called multidimensional gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, olfactometry. This is a technique that combines sensory evaluation as part of the analytical approach. Since Roger, all, can I just break uh, in for a minute? I am sorry, Roger. Yes, sir. Uh, I apologize for this, but if you have a question, please type it into the question se session at any time, and we will have a 10-minute question and answer session at the end of the seminar. I apologize, Roger, for breaking in. No problem. Um, since we are evaluating the headspace created by the samples of interest, this methodology can be utilized on almost any type of sample. We all know how sensitive the nose can be we are always performing some type of sensory evaluation. A few examples could include when you walk into a restaurant, of course, you're expecting uh, the aroma of the food to be pleasing, and you're just waiting to, uh, take, to, to enjoy it. Of course, there's the uh, dead skunk on the, si on the side of the road that lets you know, uh, your nose lets you know that that's a bad, bad situation. And another example would be how many people have taken that half-empty carton of milk out of the refrigerator and performed a sensory evaluation before they considered drinking it. In each of these examples, the olfactory information that was given to you by your nose determines whether, you've, whether you have a positive or negative response to the situation. Before delving into the details of this technique, I'd like, to, like you to think about some aroma and odor and challenges that you may face with your product. Whenever a customer opens your product, you would like them to have a positive response. What are some of the items that the customer is evaluating at the, that very moment? If it is a food product, I have shown here a certain, just a few, a few reactions that they could have or that they're evaluating. They're, of course, looking at the aroma of the product. They're worried about the texture of the product, uh, the color, the freshness. And I'm certain there are many other um, points of interest that could be added to this list. A second challenge that you may consider for your food type product could be packaging concerns. And of course, the primary goal of the package is meant to protect the product from the outside world. However, there, there could be odors from the packaging itself. The odors could be from the polymer. I mean, obviously, the Polymers could be emitting something, the coatings, the adhesives, the solvents, the inks. If you were to analyze the headspace created by the package, you would find that there were numerous odorous and non-odorous compounds that could be identified. The package is also supposed to protect the flavors and aromas of the product. And one effect that the package could have is that the flavor compounds could be scalped by the package. Or a second effect could be that the packaging could allow the flavor compounds to permeate through and out of and out of the package. For both of these cases, what, what you need to know is, is there enough total loss of the flavor volatiles to weaken the flavor? Or is the overall flavor profile altered significantly enough to change the taste of the product? At least in the case of permeation, these chemical compounds could be used as challenge materials for testing of the permeation, testing the package for permeation. Lastly, the package could also be considered from the other side. While it's protecting what's inside, it's also protecting what should be coming in from the outside from the environment. Lastly, another concern or challenge that you may face is the crisis. This is the greatest challenge because you don't really know what caused the problem, but you need to find out quickly. One example would be your customer has complained of an odd smell when they opened their cereal bag. How do you go ahead and determine what the malodor is? How do you determine where it came from? How do you reduce or eliminate the problem? Uh, along those lines, did something change with the film supplier? Or is the ink changed? And, or is the ink now 
leaching through the package, causing a chemical reaction? Or has your product been exposed to an environment that was different in this, in this transportation chain? Some of these questions can be obtained by identifying the chemical compound that is responsible for causing the off-odor in your product. Historically, there are two basic approaches to assessing and monitoring aromas and odors. On one side, there is the human sensory panel. These are the people who believe that the olfactory response is very complex and requires the human element to, be, to evaluate it fully. They are well-schooled and well-trained. In many cases, they follow procedures that are developed by the ASTM E18 committee, which has generated numerous protocols for sensory evaluation. These protocols include the sample preparation, sample presentation, and the data processing. These protocols have been developed to extract as much information as possible from the data that is generated by the sensory panels. These panels are very good for product development, determining the acceptability of the product, and et cetera. But when they encounter an unacceptable or bad off odor or flavor, they may not be able to identify the chemical compound that is creating the problem. Identification of the chemical compound is critical to finding the solution to the problem. Once you know what you're looking for, then the process can be scrutinized to determine the possible origin of the problem compound. On the other side of the assessment approaches is the instrumental method. The analytical instrumentation such as gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, two-dimensional gas chromatography, the electronic nose are all utilized in this process. These are the people who believe that when, if you're given enough computational power, a complex spectrum can be broken down and evaluated for the odor causing compounds. Of course, for the gas chromatographic approaches, samples are analyzed a list, and a list of compounds are generated. This, is the li this list is the basis for determining the possible odor causing compounds that were contained in the sample. Each of these methods has its limitations. The sensory panels may not be able to identify the chemical compounds. And on the other hand, the instruments, they, might not be, they are not able to identify identify the aromas that are associated with the chemical compounds. In contrast, by combining the olfactory component with the multidimensional gas chromatography mass spectrometry technique, a sensory instrument is created that is a bridge between the two approaches. The human sensory portion or olfactory that is used in this, in this instrument can direct the critical instrument correlations that are necessary to identify identify the offending compounds. In short, this methodology can be summed up as sensory directed odor or aroma analysis. Also over the years we have found that the rule rather than the exception is that the off odor is generally the result of a compound that is present in the product or sample at a very low concentration and is located amongst a forest of other compounds. A typical Coal gas chromatograph consists of an inlet, a column for separation, and a detector. But for comparison, this is a schematic of the typical multidimensional GCMS olfactory system. This system has the main points, the difference between the system is that it has two columns which are connected in series. The typical first column is a nonpolar column, the second column is a polar column. The inlet allows for the introduction of samples, be it liquid or using the solid phase micro extraction fibers. Once the sample is put into the instrument, it of course goes through the separation process and through the two columns and it comes out into the open split interface which directs the effluent to both the mass spectrometer detector and the olfactory detector. And this allows for the simultaneous detection of, of the aromas and the mass spectral information. What's important about this instrument is that there is a piece of hardware in the middle um, called the hard cut valve which controls the flow through the instrument. This allows for a small portion of the first of the material separated in the first column to be introduced into the second column for subsequent separation. 
by controlling the flow and doing this hard cut process, we have the ability to reduce the background and eliminate compounds that could be eluding at the same time as, as the compound that we're trying to identify. In the next slide here, we show the olfactory component of this instrument. We have the scientist, our olfactory detector, sitting at the SNF port performing the olfactory analysis. As mentioned, the SNF port is connected to the end of the second column of the gas chromatograph using the open split interface. So as, as the compounds are presented at the SNF port, the individual uses a specialized record-keeping software package that allows the user to quickly identify and characterize the aroma or odor events that they are sensing at the SNF port. A blow-up of this characterization panel is shown here. In this case, it, when the human detector or the olfactory person is performing the analysis, they are utilizing this panel, as I mentioned, to record the corresponding odor assessments to for each of the individual compounds that are eluded. So if they sense a compound that has a sweet or fruity smell to them, they of course would click on those buttons there. And then after that event goes away, they have an opportunity to give it a, give it a relative response based on their assessment. Was it very faint? Was it medium? Or did it blow your socks off? so that you had to back away from the SNF port. This program is used the entire time that the analyst is sitting by the SNF port. And then after the process is done, you go ahead and re rerun the program. And what you generate is what, what is called an aromagram. In this case, I show an aromagram that was acquired from a, a, the headspace of a ground coffee sample. This was just a short five minute collection on a solid phase micro extraction fiber or spemi fiber. And you see here that the uh, number of aroma notes that I was able to sense was only, in this case, there were only 24 aroma notes, but you can see each one, each of them had a different characteristic and they occurred at various retention times from, from the uh, analysis. One concept that we need to understand when we deal with aromas is the odor threshold concentrations. And what I show here is a table with a number of compounds that many people may be familiar with. At the top of the lit table are compounds which have a low impact odor, which are low impact odorants. At the bottom of the table are those compounds which we would consider high impact odorants. You can see that those at the top have a very high threshold concentration. And what that means is that is the approximate concentration that needs to be exceeded before a, most people would start to smell it. So if you're smelling isopropyl alcohol, you're, the concentration in that vicinity is greater than 26 parts per million. As you can see, if you go down the table, compounds like hydrogen sulfide, which you would expect from uh, rot rotten eggs, or you see that that's approximately 0.4 parts per trillion, uh, parts per billion. Isovaleric acid is characteristic acid that you'd smell if you were looking, if you were um, looking at uh, Parmesan cheese. Petrisol is the typical compound you'd get from uh, passing by a feedlot. Diacetyl is the buttery flavor in your popcorn, and tribromoanisol is a compound that it provides a musty, moldy odor. And you may have heard about it a number of years back with a problem with the pharmaceutical products. If you look at those numbers and translate the zeros, you'll find that tribromoanisole, for example, that concentration ends up being 30 parts per quadrillion. So what that means is that it takes a very small amount of that compound to provide an odor for someone to see. To, to sense using their nose. And of course, if you're using your standard analytical techniques to find that compound, you wouldn't be able to find it. However, with the ability of using your nose to identify where that compound could elute, you of course can write methods to make the measurement of that compound quite easily. 
For comparison, the next slide shows the, what I call the aroma threshold concentrations. In this, in this case, I'm doing it for a, a number of flavor compounds rather than just the, uh, the odors. And you can see it's a similar process where menthol, benzaldehyde, limonene, these are all compounds that have a descriptor of menthol, of course, minty, limonene, citrusy. But you can see that the odor threshold concentration for those compounds is, are quite low. And some of the other ones, like vanilla, are even lower. So from, a, from an analytical perspective, be it an odor compound or an aroma compound, you have to work with them both in the same way to, to perform the analysis. So in the next slide, I'd like to go back to that coffee analysis and show you the data that was the total ion chromatogram that was collected from the GCMS information during that coffee run. And you can see here there are a large number of peaks that were present from that run. And you remember <clears throat> in the next slide here, I have the aromagram and the chromatogram overlaid on top of each other. And you can see that the, at some of the, at some of the uh, retention times, the GC peaks and the aromagram peaks overlay quite well with, with each other, allowing for easy identification of the compound. In some other areas, there are many GC peaks indicating volatile organic compounds, but no aroma compounds present. And then for the region above 17 and a half minutes of retention time, this, is, this shows how, how well this methodology works for the identification of aroma and odor compounds. By having the olfactory capability available, we are able to sense four aroma notes in that time frame. And you can see looking at the mass spectral information, if, there was, if that was what you were relying on to perform your analysis, there would be no reason to look for any compounds in that region. But because we have our olfactory response, we know that there's compounds there of interest and they're present at a very low concentration. Consequently, knowing that the aromas are there, if these were important compounds to your product or to the problem that you were trying to solve, we would go back and look at those retention time areas and try to make a compound identification using the mass spectral information. In the next slide, we have one more way of presenting the data that we acquire from our aroma analysis. And that is shown here, where we have the retention time for this analytical setup. These are the times where the compounds were eluded from the, from the GC. I have identified the odor character that go are associated with those retention times. And of course, I've gone ahead and made a tentative identification of a number of the compounds that are associated with them. You can see the list is quite varied. And um, some of those compounds are pretty some of those compounds are you know, pretty uh, useful in, in making the flavor of the coffee. So from a methodology standpoint, the aroma tracks, multidimensional GC, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, olfactory instrument is very important analytical tool for allowing for the methodology, allowing for the identification of chemical compounds. We analyze the headspace of the samples. So uh, we can apply this to many different types of samples. This methodology provides a direct correlation between the aroma notes and the chemical compounds that are creating them. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, the GCMS analysis alone only provides information about the volatiles that can be measured by the mass spectrometer, but there's not any aroma information that can be associated with that. So the, by, by adding the aroma analysis and the mass spectral analysis, we are able to identify the chemical compounds in most cases. I'm going to demonstrate this methodology by looking at two case studies, starting with 
the first case study deals with bottled drinking water. And what we had is that century evaluation of two bottled drinking water samples confirmed that both of these samples that we were looking at had similar a similar peculiar off odor. The odor was characterized as a foul, nauseating, infected wound type odor. And of course, when we're dealing with bottled water, that is very the bottled water is particularly pertinent because there are no odor masking or flavor masking compounds that are that are part of that bottled water. And of course, when we have an off odor problem, we are of course trying to identify the chemical compounds that are responsible for that off odor. So as I mentioned, there were two different types of samples. And what we have here are the GC MS results from each of the samples. Of course, we took some water out of the bottles, allowed the headspace to re equilibrate, and then inserted our, our fibers into that headspace and generated these the results shown here. The, you, the sample on the left, as you can see, looks very clean, uh, very few compounds that are present. The sample on the right has quite a bit more compounds in the headspace. Given these chromatographic results, the way to solve, the typical way to solve this would be to go ahead and make a list of the chemical compounds that are present in, in, these, in these results and then go and try to make an association with the possible aromas or odors that are associated with each of those compounds that you have on your list. But since we have the olfactory analysis as a possibility, we see that in both samples there were compounds that eluded at approximately 9 and 11 minutes, which were identical to the overall aroma that we sensed in the headspace of these samples. So on the sample on the left, we see that at 9 and 11 minutes, there is very little mass spectral intensity to deal with. For the sample on the right, of course, we have all the other compounds that are over that are preventing the identification of the other, of the off odor compounds. What we found out is that the odor causing compounds were, were, sulf, were sulfur compounds, and then knowing this information, the you can go back into the process or into the supply line and try to determine where they could have come from. Additional analyses could have been performed on the on the plastic itself, the plastic bottles, the slip agent, the ink. Um, it also could have been, in this case, the water could have been contaminated with the sulfur compounds to start with. But these are additional samples that we could look at knowing that the chemical compounds, knowing which chemical compounds we can look for. A second case study deals with an off-odor in a packaged seafood product. And in this case, the experiment was performed as a good-bad comparison between the two. And the off-odor that we were searching for was characterized as a foul, harsh, cat, urine, or heated plastic type odor. And of course, the good sample had the typical fish-based uh, odor that you would expect from seafood. So taking the products, we of course would analyze the headspace. And here we have the two GC results from each of the samples. In the, the green line represents the results that were obtained from the good sample. The black line indicates the results that were obtained from the bad sample. And the major difference between these, in this case here, um, is the peak at six and a half minutes. This represents toluene, but from an odor standpoint, we would not sense any difference among these two samples. However, I've blown up a region of interest here where as we were doing the olfactory analysis on these samples, at approximately 12.7 minutes, there was a, the odor causing, there was the aroma or off odor that we had sensed in the original product. So in this case, at 12 and, 12 and a half, 12.7 minutes, you can see there's a number of volatile organic compounds that are present. The green line, again, represents the bad sample, the black line, the good sample. But you know there are many compounds there. So in order to get a compound identification, 
we of course would do the process of hard cutting where we take a small portion from the first column and put it into the second column. And when we do that, we have the following results shown here. And you can see at approximately 12.7 minutes, there's a small peak uh, in agreement with the odor that we sensed at the sniff port. Looking at the intensity of this peak and knowing the amount of material that we had in the sample and what we were working with, we would estimate that this peak would be on the order of a part per billion or even part per trillion level. So that makes the chemical identification a little bit challenging. But once we were able to do that, then we were able to go back into the process and look at where the problem compound was happening. Normally, this process would occur by going back and looking at the, the package by itself and then looking at the seafood by itself. And what we found when we did that is that this off-odor compound was not present in either one of those uh, samples. So what that led us to believe is that there must have been some variety of chemical reaction going between the seafood and the package to create the off-odor that we were looking for. So we took a different package sample, the one that was creating the bad odor, and now looked at it again. And you can see the bad package had the, had the typical toluene sample that we looked at, that we saw in the good sample. But in this case, this package, which was creating the problem, had an additional peak called mesotyl oxide. And this, after we identified it, we decided that it was, in fact, a precursor that could be that could react with some compound from the seafood to create the off-odor compound that we identified. And that's what we found. After we saw the mesotyl oxide, we went into the seafood and started evaluating some of the non-odor causing compounds in there. And we were able to identify a compound of interest that could go through and react. So what we were able to show was that the off-odor that was the problem in the seafood product was created by the chemical interaction of the compounds that were separately in the seafood and the packaged material. So in summary, this multidimensional gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, olfactometry approach is a bridge between the sensory side of an evaluation and the instrument side of the evaluation. This methodology allows us to perform what we call sensory directed aroma analysis. It also allows for a direct correlation between the aromas and odors and the compounds that are responsible for them. This methodology, since we're looking at the headspace that are created by the samples, it can be applied to a large variety of samples. And finally, since many compounds that are causing odors or aromas are present at very low concentrations, the olfactory capability provides additional orders of magnitude increases in sensitivity so that you can make a determination of the chemical compounds that are in a sample that are well below the detection limits that you would find in a normal instrumental, instrumental analysis. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your time and attention.